and urgently calls for ceasefire in Lebanon and Gaza. Canada expels six Indian diplomats, including High Commissioner. Good afternoon and salam, Lisa Madani. You're watching World Today with me, Sahih Samshidin. The United Nations has called for an urgent need for ceasefires in both Lebanon and Gaza to avert a broader regional conflict with ramifications for the whole world. Speaking at the start of the UNHCR Refugee Agency's annual executive committee meeting in Geneva, UN Refugee Chief Filippo Grandi insisted that only a ceasefire could stem the tide to a major regional war with global implications. A ceasefire for Lebanon, but also, as is desperately needed in Gaza, a ceasefire that is sustained by a meaningful peace process, difficult as it may be. This is the only way to break the cycle of violence, of hatred and of misery. His comments came amid escalating Israeli attacks on Lebanon, where more than 1,300 people have been killed and a million displaced since late September. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who has just returned from Lebanon and neighbouring Syria, also slammed attacks impacting humanitarian workers. Grandi paid tribute to two UNHCR workers killed in Israeli airstrike in Lebanon last month and also highlighted the 226 staff working for the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, killed in Gaza in the past year. The second phase of a polio vaccination campaign started on Monday in central Gaza before moving to the south and later to the north. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, the second dose of polio vaccine was being administered in addition to vitamin A to protect children against the spread of epidemics and diseases. WHO said the campaign aims to reach about 590,000 children under the age of 10 across the Gaza Strip in less than two weeks as part of the second round of the vaccination campaign. On Friday, the United Nations voiced concerns that the fighting and the evacuation orders in northern Gaza might affect the vaccination campaign. The first round of vaccination was undertaken last month after a baby was partially paralysed by the type 2 polio virus in August, the first such case in the territory in 25 years. Meanwhile, the Lebanese Red Cross said at least 21 people were killed in a strike on North Lebanon on Monday, with the health ministry and official media reporting an Israeli raid on the Christian majority area far from Hezbollah strongholds. The Red Cross said 18 were killed and 4 wounded in the strike on A2, referring to a village in the Christian majority Zakarta district. The health ministry earlier said an Israeli strike there killed nine people, with the official national news agency also saying Israel targeted a residential apartment in the village. Witnesses at the site of the strike said it had leveled a residential building at the entrance to the village. Body parts were scattered in the rubble, with Red Cross volunteers searching for survivors in the wreckage while ambulances evacuated wounded people. The Lebanese army imposed a security cordon in the area where the strike had also sparked a fire. On Saturday, the health ministry reported two dead and four wounded in an Israeli strike on Derbela, some 15 kilometers from the town of Batrun on Lebanon's north coast. DNA tests were being carried out to determine the identity of the remains. Canada expelled six Indian diplomats, including the High Commissioner, on Monday, linking them to the murder of a Sikh separatist leader and alleging a broader effort to target Indian descendants in Canada. Canada is a country rooted in the rule of law, and the protection of our citizens is paramount. That's why, when our law enforcement and intelligence officials began pursuing credible allegations that agents of the government of India were directly involved in the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar, on Canadian soil, we responded. Earlier in the day, India retaliated by ordering the expulsion of six high-ranking Canadian diplomats, including the acting High Commissioner, and said it had withdrawn its envoy from Canada, 
contradicting Canada's statement of expulsion. The diplomatic role represents a major deterioration of relations between the two Commonwealth countries. Ties have been frayed since Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said last year he had evidence linking Indian agents to the assassination of Sikh leader Hardeep Singh Nijar on Canadian territory. India has long denied Trudeau's accusations. Chinese Premier Li Qiang was accorded a guard of honour at the Prime Minister's house after he arrived in Islamabad, where he met his Pakistani counterpart, Shabazz Sharif, on Monday. Pakistan's capital was under strict security lockdown as Chinese Premier Li Qiang landed in the city on Monday, ahead of a heads-of-government gathering of the Shanghai Corporation Organization this week. Both the Premiers held delegation-level talks. Sharif's office said that he and Lee discussed economic and trade ties and cooperation under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPAC, a $65 billion investment in the South Asian country under Chinese President Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative. They both also inaugurated virtually the CPAC-funded Gwadar International Airport in restive southwestern Balochistan province in a ceremony telecast live by Pakistan state-run TV. According to Pakistan's Prime Minister's office, Lee's visit is the first by a Chinese Premier to Pakistan in 11 years. Cyprus President Nikos Christodoulidis met with British Prime Minister Keir Starmer for talks on Monday. The two leaders had discussion at Downing Street and Christodoulidis was heard to be asking for strong British support to end the political division on the island of Cyprus. Chris Todoulidis made a whistle-stop visit to meet Stammer before he heads to the United Nations in New York where he hopes to open talks aimed at ending the decades-long ethnic divide on the island. Turkey, Britain and Greece were named guarantors of Cyprus sovereignty in 1960 with rights to intervene if there is a breakdown of constitutional order. Citing those rights, Ankara invaded Cyprus in July 1974 after the junta, then ruling Greece staged a brief coup five days earlier which toppled the legitimate Cyprus government. The Cyprus crisis caused the collapse of Greece's seven-year military dictatorship. Constitutional, order was safely restored on Cyprus, but Turkey never withdrew. Britain holds on to 3% of Cypriot territory known as sovereign base areas, partly for military purposes. Prabowo Subianto, born in 1951 to one of the Indonesia's most prominent families, is a former lieutenant general. He's married and has a son with the daughter of Indonesia's former president, Suharto. Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, is to witness the inauguration of the nation's eighth president and vice president on Sunday following a February election won by recurring candidate Prabowo Subianto and son of outgoing president Joko Widodo, Gibran Rakabuming Raka. The president-elect, former defense minister Prabowo, won after his third attempt at the presidency. Prabowo Subianto, born in 1951 to one of the Indonesia's most prominent families, is a former lieutenant general. He's married and has a son with the daughter of Indonesia's former president, Suharto, Siti Hidayati Haryadi, and is himself the son of one of the country's most respected economic planners. In 2009, Prabowo ran for the vice presidency alongside presidential candidate Megawati Sukarno Putri. The pair were nevertheless defeated by Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. Vying for the top job, Prabowo joined the 2014 presidential elections race alongside his running mate, Hatta Rajasa. However, he lost to Jakarta Governor Joko Widodo. In September 2018, Prabowo decided to run for president for a second time alongside running mate Sandiaga Uno. Jokowi appointed Prabowo as defense minister during his second run in 2019, who then went back into the candidacy pool for the 2023-2024 election season for a third time. Macron defends EU moves to improve tariffs on Chinese EVs. That and more coming up next. French President Emmanuel Macron on Monday defended the European Union's recent move to impose tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles, which has spurred a tit-for-tat trade dispute between Brussels and Beijing. 
traverse un moment difficile parce qu'il y a une contraction du marché européen et une très forte concurrence chinoise. Et donc je pense que c'est nécessaire dans ces moments-là bah, d'abord de se protéger pour mettre en quelque sorte des règles équitables. C'est-à-dire quand vous avez des subventions sur certains constructeurs en Chine, c'est normal qu'on mette des tarifs pour les compenser. Sinon on ne joue pas avec des règles équitables. C'est ce qu'a fait la Commission européenne et que nous soutenons. Macron's comments come as Chinese and European automakers went head to head at the Paris car show. This year's event, the largest car show in Europe, comes at a pivotal time. Struggling European automakers need to prove they are still in the game, while Chinese rivals are aiming to get a foothold in a competitive market. Macron said France has gained momentum in the electric vehicle market, with Renault new electrics R5 model on display at the fair. The World Health Organization said it received pledges worth $700 million for its 2025 to 2028 budget at an event in Berlin on Monday, in addition to $300 million already pledged by the European and African unions. Germany said it would provide at least 360 million euros, equivalent to $392.47 million. Germany and the United States are the biggest country donors to Geneva-based organization. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said recently just a handful of countries have provided large amounts of funding, adding that it would be better for every country to spread the responsibility recently, across many more shoulders. He, however, noted that every contribution counts, no matter how small. WHO members agreed two years ago to overhaul its funding model, which has been described as fundamentally rotten due to its over-reliance on the whims of donors. The agreement means obligatory fees should rise to up to 50% of the budget by 2030 to 2031 from just 16% in recent years. Half a million consumers in Latin America's largest city are still without electricity three days after a violent gale knocked down power lines and caused a blackout. The delay in resumption of power supply has led to criticism of the distributor from politicians and authorities with calls to cancel the concession. Anil Sao Paulo said it would need time to restore parts of the electricity network that was damaged on Friday night by winds of more than 100 km per hour. At least five people died in the storm that knocked over trees in the city streets. According to Anil Sao Paulo, 537,000 consumers were still without electricity as of midday on Monday. Blackouts that have occurred repeatedly since last year have angered Sao Paulo consumers and led authorities to fine the company for delays in restoring services. Anon's contingency plan calls for 2,500 people working to restore services in extreme weather situation, but its field teams numbered 1,700 to 1,800 people 48 hours after the storm. Teams from the fire brigade and civil defense responded to over 500 incidents throughout the state regarding fallen trees and collapsed walls. Sean Didi Combs was confronted with six new sexual abuse lawsuits on Monday, including one accusing the rap mogul of assaulting a minor. The lawsuit was filed a month after Combs was criminally charged for what prosecutors describe as a long-running scheme of sex trafficking and racketeering. The rapper has denied wrongdoing in other civil cases against him and pleaded not guilty in his criminal case. The lawsuits were filed in New York federal court by anonymous plaintiffs, including one man who accuses Combs of assaulting him when he was a minor. Combs was arrested in September and charged with three felony counts, four racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking and transportation to engage in prostitution. He pleaded not guilty on 17 September. A judge denied Combs' request for bail on 10 October and set a trial date of 5 May 2025. The lawsuits on Monday were filed by Houston-based lawyer Tony Busby, who has said he is representing 120 people who accused Combs of abuse. NASA launched a spacecraft on Monday to Jupiter's moon Europa, considered one of our solar system's most promising spots to search for life beyond Earth. NASA says the mission aims to learn whether the ice encased world, believed to harbor a vast underground ocean, is habitable. The U.S. Space Agency's robotic solar-powered Europa Clipper spacecraft launched on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket from the Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, carrying nine scientific instruments. 
After travelling 2.9 billion kilometres in a trip lasting about five and a half years, Europa Clipper is due to enter orbit around Jupiter in 2030. Scientists have a keen interest in the salty liquid water ocean that previous observations have indicated resides below Europa's icy shell. Europa Clipper is the biggest spacecraft NASA has ever built for a planetary mission, measuring about 30.5 meters long, about 17.6 meters wide, and weighing approximately 6,000 kilograms. It is larger than a basketball court because of its sizable solar arrays to gather sunlight for powering scientific instruments, electronics, and its other subsystems. Still to come in sports, lackluster performance for Haimau Malaya in New Zealand friendly match. The national football squad failed to match the progress of New Zealand's 95th ranked team in the world after losing 4-0 in a Tier 1 international friendly match at the North Harbour Stadium in Auckland yesterday. All four New Zealand goals came in the second half of the match as the first half had ended scoreless despite a flurry of chances created by the home team. In their first meeting after 18 years, the Harimau Malaya squad under Pau Marti Vicente started on cautious note and struggled to find their rhythm of play, allowing the superior New Zealand to dominate possession. The start of the second half was a different ball game as New Zealand started exerting their dominance and Ahmad Shian was beaten for the first time when just who was unmarked inside the box broke the deadlock in the 53rd minute following a quick counter-attack. Stunned by the goal, Malaysia tried to stage a fight back but it was New Zealand who extended their lead through Matthew Garbutt in the 61st minute. The introduction of Nottingham Forest striker Chris Wood added on to the Harimau Malaya squad's misery as a 32-year-old headed in New Zealand's third goal in the 72nd minute to kill off any chance of a comeback by Vicente's boys. As the match was heading into the final minutes, second-half substitute Logan Rogerson ensued a convincing victory for all whites when he scored the fourth goal in the 90th minute. Randall Kolo Moani scored twice as front held on to secure a vital 2-1 win over Belgium in an untrailing encounter in the Nations League in Brussels early this morning. Kolo Moani had opened the scoring for the visitors with a penalty following a wood face handball just 12 minutes after Yuri Tielemans had blazed over from spots, conquering a golden chance to give Belgium the lead. As France looked set to head into halftime with the lead, Timothy Cassani found Luis Penda at the back post to head home, the equaliser for Domenico Tedesco Mens in the third minute of stoppage time. Upon the hour mark, France had Manu Kohn goal ruled out for handball in the build-up, but just two minutes later saw the lead restored through a Carlo Moani header. The pressure on France mounted late on as Aurelien Tumeni picked up a second yellow for a foul on Tillemans but Didier Deschamps men remain resolute to earn their fifth successive win against Belgium. Meanwhile, in Munich, Germany booked a place in the Nations League quarterfinals after midfielder Jamie Leveling enjoyed a dream international debut by scoring the winner in a hard-fought 1-0 home success over the Netherlands in Group A3. The 23-year-old Leveling, one of the two Germany debutants, had the ball in the net in the second minute when Safford was ruled offside. He did score in the 64th though, firing into a top corner after the Dutch failed to properly clear a corner. Germany are top on 10 points from four matches and guaranteed a place in the last eight, with the Dutch five points behind in second ahead of Hungary on goal difference.
Major bodies representing footballers and clubs in Europe on Monday filed a complaint to the European Commission accusing FIFA of abusing its position over changes to the international match calendar and tournament expansions. FIF Pro Europe, the European League's body and Spain's La Liga said that the football world governing body holds conflicting roles as governing body and competition organiser which gave rise to a conflict of interest. The bodies presented their complaint at a press conference in Brussels saying that FIFA's imposition of decisions on the international calendar is an abuse of dominance and violates EU law. Enough is enough. We can't take it anymore. Um, we have now an international match calendar which is beyond saturation, which creates a lot of issues for domestic leagues in terms of scheduling, but also in terms of organizing other com domestic competitions. An international match calendar which creates risks for players, for their health. Um, and we've tried to engage with FIFA on that for years now without any positive response. FIFA has also been accused of a failure to consult over recent changes to the calendar, such as the introduction of a 32-team club World Cup. France coach Didier Deschamps said on Monday that a report claiming captain Kylian Mbappe was being investigated for rape in Sweden is not a good thing for the national team. His comments came in response to questions about Mbappe, the France keeper who was allowed to sit out of team games this month in order to work on his fitness. That was already a source of controversy in the build-up to last Thursday's win against Israel before a newspaper in Sweden on Monday claimed that the Real Madrid striker was being investigated for rape following a visit to Stockholm. After Swedish newspaper, Affonblé reported that an alleged rape had been reported to police but did not say who was accused. Another publication expressing said 25-year-old Mbappe was the suspect. The player has denounced the report as a fake news. Portugal head coach Roberto Martinez came under criticism for his decision to stick with Ronaldo as his starting striker after Portugal's disappointing quarter-final exit from Euro 2024. The head coach insisted his captain, Cristiano Ronaldo, is no ordinary 39-year-old ahead of the second Nations League match of the international breakaway to Scotland on Tuesday. Um, Ronaldo doesn't work as a 39 player, a 39 years old player. He doesn't play certainly as a 39 years old player. I think we assess in every player in how they feel. Uh, Cristiano has been working really well in this in this camp, and I feel that we've got 26 players. That that was the decision to be able that we could use. So I'm confident that we can carry on adding information, but in terms of, uh, I've got no doubt that Cristiano after 60 minutes can be involved in the second game. I don't know if he can start or if he can finish the game, but he can certainly be involved as he showed in the last camp. The five-time Ballon d'Or winner who has plied his trade with Saudi Arabia's Al Nassar since 2003 was on the pitch for over an hour in Portugal's 3-1 victory over Poland on Saturday before being replaced by Liverpool forward Diogo Jota. Ronaldo scored the Silecchio's second just before half-time to make it three goals from the opening three matches of the current Nations League campaign. In tennis, Paula Badosa fought back from a set down to advance to the second round of the Ningbo Open in China on Monday. She beat Diana Schneider 6-4, 3-6, 6-3 to reach the second round at the WTA 500 tournament. Both players saved a break point in the second and third game of the opening set and went on serve until the 10th game when Badosa broke serve on her second set point to win the first set 6-4. Schneider broke twice in the seventh and ninth game to win the second set 6-3. Schneider started the third set with an early break in the first game. Badosa won three consecutive games with two breaks of serve to take a 3-1 lead while Schneider pulled back on serve 4-2-3. World number 32, Yulia Putinseva of Kazakhstan has advanced to the second round of the 2024 Ningbo Open China. The Kazakh athlete defeated American Caroline Dollarhide with a score of 6-2-6 left. 
Putin Seva did not lose a single game after the score 0 2 in the first set. The match lasted one hour and seven minutes. In the second round, Putin Seva will clash with the winner of China's Yafan Wang and Brazil's Beatrice Haddad Maya clash. New Zealand took a 4-0 lead over Britain in the America's Cup defence on Monday with the crews locked in a tight early tacking duel and close passes in the first downwind leg before the Kiwis took control to win the race. The New Zealand crew ultimately managed to get slightly more performance out of their AC-75 Monohal Tahero, piling the pressure on Britain during the closest race so far in the first two seven-win series against Ben Ensley's Britannia. Ensley's British team, who was still smarting from an umpire's decision that went against them on Sunday in the pre-start, protested against the New Zealanders during a series of close crosses as the boat sped downwind. He said that a reserve day on Tuesday would give the crew a good opportunity to work on ways to narrow the click in performance gap they were seeing against New Zealand's boat. Ansley's co-helm, Dylan Fletcher, said he was disappointed by the umpire's decision on Sunday, but the team would take a good look and see where they could eke out the gains needed to win. New Zealand's ever-relaxed keeper, Peter Berling, said every win on the board was a super nice one, adding that it had felt far more like a boat race on Monday than it had the day before when he expressed concern over a pre-start near crash. Perlawanan Bola Sepak Liga Super 2024 Aksi-aksi dan asakan terus diledakkan dalam setiap pertembungan bagi memburu ruang mendominasi perlawanan Jumaat 18 Oktober Kelantan Darul Naim FC bertemu Kuala Lumpur City FC 8.30 minit malam di saluran OK dan saluran Sukan RTM Saksikan juga secara penstriman langsung di RTM Click. That wraps up the world today this time around in our top story. UN urgently calls for ceasefire in Lebanon and Gaza. Till next time, I'm Sahih Samshuddin, Malaysia Madani. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you for watching.